still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go Through the voice of woe His voice to me is calling And he walks with me And he talks with me And he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known A readings from Philippians 3, verses 1 through 14. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, because like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, 
but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. While Pastor Jim is away on vacation, we're very blessed to have Rick Hansen from the China Lake Camp come and preach for us today. Hello. It's uh, good to be with you today. Um, Before I dig into the message, uh, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you uh, for all the ways that this congregation has loved on our family and the ministry at China Lake Camp. We are very grateful and blessed by the ways that you prayerfully take care of us. Um, Thank you doesn't seem like enough, but I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you. We're talking today um, about this scripture, which talks about identity. And in this country, I think it's safe to say that we're having an identity crisis right now. The problem is that so many different identities think that theirs is most important. The problem is, with all these different identities, we're having a hard time coming together. Even in Christian circles, I've seen some of my church leader friends who are posting as many things about their political or cultural preferences as they do about things that are scriptural or sharing the the good news of the gospel. Maybe for some of us, it's an ethnic identity that we Uh, that we hold to, that we put on high on our priority list. Or it could be uh, work, our career, our family role, maybe a board or committee that we serve on. These are things that we're, we're proud of. And when somebody asks who we are, this is often what we use to identify ourselves. When someone asks you who you are, How do you identify yourself? How do you introduce yourself to people that you meet? Now, we all want to be uh, able to tell somebody that we are from a long line of kings or queens or celebrities, famous people. Not usually too eager to let people know about the the villains in our family (laughs) or the infamous characters. My prayer for all of us is that our identity is that we are Christians, that we are children of God first and foremost. According to Paul, we should focus more on where we are at now and what is coming for us as Christians as opposed to what is behind us. Now, identifying as children of God requires some changes. We're told in Scripture that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The psalmist asked God to create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We're told in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Even knowing this, so many of us and our fellow professing Christians continue to wear the rags of humanity instead of the robes of righteousness. It's like a guy I know. He doesn't like to be used in sermons but I'm about the best example of what not to do, so I use myself as an example. I suffer from regular back pain. Um, And it can usually be repaired by a quick trip to the chiropractor. My back takes a lot of abuse, not because I'm necessarily hardworking or have a lot of heavy lifting to do, but it's because I weigh too much. And it's because the boots I wear are worn out unevenly. 
Now, by making a couple of simple adjustments in my life, I could save myself a lot of pain and <laughs> frustration. If I lost a little bit of weight and got some new boots, I'd be in much better shape. Sir Isaac Newton noted that every object will remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line until it's acted upon, compelled to change its state by the action of an external force. It's the same in our spiritual lives, too. We're going to continue down the same road until something acts in our life to change us. The course that we're all on by nature of our nature is for destruction. We're naturally bent on self-sufficiency, survival, comfort. Chasing after those things that bring us what we need and get us what we want as quickly as possible. We also tend to want to get the first pick of what's there. We want the best, not the rest. As this analogy came to me this week, I was reminded uh, of my childhood. I used to watch a show called The Dukes of Hazard, And in that show, Bo and Luke Duke were always racing somewhere, usually to get away from the law. As they raced away from the sheriff or deputy, it seemed like they were always wound up on a road with a detour sign or a bridge out sign. Rather than stopping or turning around, they almost always sped up and broke through the sign and made the jump and landed safely on the other side. Now, that's nice for TV, but in a little bit of research, I found out that the Dukes of Hazard show lasted 147 episodes. In those 147 episodes, they completely wrecked 300 cars. So what we see on TV is not uh, represent, representative of reality. <laughs> but it'll be the same way for our lives. Those signs that we see, the law that is there, to some degree is there for the safety of everyone. And so it's good to abide by that. But if our destination and our course are all wrong, then going that way is not in our best interest. Fortunately, God provided a detour for whosoever will accept it. The Bible is full of examples of people who were going the wrong way, and God mercifully redirected them. There are examples of people in bad situations that chose to identify themselves with God rather than to take the easy or the uh, most acceptable way out. You might recall that Moses identified as an Egyptian for most of his young life. He was raised in the Pharaoh's palace. And then, after murdering an Egyptian, he ran away. And that's where God found him. And God found that he could use Moses. God knew that he could use Moses. And he sent him back to Egypt to save the Israelites and to bring them out of captivity. We also consider how God used Joseph and Naomi, David, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Esther, Nehemiah, and so many others who were in unfortunate circumstances that they had no control over. But they chose to have their identity affiliated with God. They refused to stand down. And God blessed them, and God blessed millions because of them. We also know that God transformed lives, like Rahab and Ruth, Others who were outside of the Jewish family, they were brought in and ultimately became part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. We look at the life of Jesus. 
and his disciples, later Saul of Tarsus, and many who faithfully stood and fearlessly faced persecution while publicly identifying themselves as believers in the way. These are the names of men and women who set aside their own comfort, their own well-being, in order to assume a new identity in Christ. Paul said it this way, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus said this, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life must lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Do you recall the moment when you surrendered to Christ? Do you remember when you became convinced that Jesus was the way and the truth and the life and that your life and eternity would be better off with him? Did you commit yourself to self-denial and letting Christ live in you? Every true follower of Christ needs to take on a new identity. It can't be superficial, but it has to be an extreme makeover of our heart and our soul, the way we use our strength and our mind, where we stop living for ourselves and we begin living according to God's perfect will. In such a transformation, or as Jesus called it, a rebirth, we commit ourselves to surrendering to Christ. The transformation normally takes time and a lot of effort and patience because we have to get rid of old habits and we have to turn aside from our selfishness. Some people make transitions like this very easily. I don't know how or why, but most of us require time and patience and nurturing to get where God needs us to be. It requires a complete overhaul of our living and thinking and our behaving and our dealing. It requires a factory reset by the Holy Spirit, so to speak. Consider Paul's description of himself in Philippians 3, where he says that if anybody had any cause to be confident in themselves, in the works of the law, it was him. And yet... After his run-in with Jesus Christ, his perspective was altered. His identity was altered. And he counted those accomplishments that he had done leading up until that point all garbage. Because he found his real worth in Christ Jesus. So where do we stand then? Our new identity in Christ consists of at least five elements. We might call those created, called, converted, conjoined, and confident. Now, for seasoned believers, this may seem like kind of an elementary lesson. You may have the experience, the tools, the network of fellow believers to know where to turn for help on deeper answers. But I want us to remember that the world we're living in has come a long way from Christ. There are many in the world and certainly even in our communities that don't have that relationship. They have never set foot in church. And they need somebody like you and like me to come along and to share the gospel message with them and to be patient with them. It might have taken you a long time to get where you are. I know it's taken me a long time to get where I am. So that's going to be our job. The opportunity's coming if it hasn't already for you. First, 
let's t uh, take the word created. It's important to acknowledge that we are God's creation and that we're made in the image of the Holy Trinity. Scripture says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's from Genesis 1, 27. We're all intentionally and lovingly made. We're designed for communion with God and modeled after spiritual perfection. But we all make the conscientious decision to pursue selfish or sinful ambitions rather than to pursue that fellowship with God. That's not what God wanted. Of course, that's not what he wanted when he gave us the freedom to make our own decisions. But he knew that might happen. He wanted us to choose obedience and fellowship with him and worship him. Amazingly, even after we decide to try and do things our own destructive way, God reaches out to us through Jesus, offering us the way to come back to him. Now, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection were a personal invitation from God directly to each and every one of us. They were like a peace offering from this God who describes himself as a jealous God. And we have insulted the Father through our actions. And yet he called all of us back to himself. The punishment for Adam and Eve's original sin was exile from Eden and separation from God. But it was not complete abandonment by God. This is how it is even now. When we look at our lives and we can't find God anywhere to be found, it's not because God has left us, but rather it's because we have left God. We have moved away from God. Malachi 3, 6 says God doesn't change. Slight paraphrase. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, He will not leave us nor forsake us. And Jeremiah and Romans both say, He has good plans for those who will call out to Him. Now, I'm not always great at returning phone calls. But this is one phone call. This is one call that none of us should ignore. The call of God to come back through Jesus. When we return God's call, we accept the opportunity to be converted. We confess that our old best way was no good and that we need salvation. You might think of it this way. Up at camp, we have an old truck for plowing. Now, it's a 1962 Dodge that I bought with a mistaken impression that an old truck would be easier to keep running. That's not true. What I'm finding is that the old parts need replacing and upgrading in order for that truck to be most useful. The equipment that was standard in 1962 just isn't the best there is here in 2020. Fuel economy, not very important back then. And the motor that I have in my one-ton truck is the same motor that a lot of passenger cars of that time had. Brake drums have made way for disc brakes, and old wasteful halogen lights have been replaced with energy-efficient LED lights. The alternator on the truck has just been upgraded, so I might be able to plow through a storm without the truck running out of power. <laughs> oh, and the truck doesn't have power steering either. <laughs> I miss that. <laughs> the truck is a brute, and lots of people say that they like the way it looks. But that old truck causes frustration and pain because it could stand to have some amount of conversion and improvement in the same way our old lives need upgrading. Without the Spirit of God, we do things for the wrong reasons. We may even try to do the right things, but for the wrong reasons, and that still makes it wrong. When we're full of the spiritual fruit, that is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
and are committed to giving more than we receive, then we are living the way the Father wants us to. We will no longer be conformed to this world, as it says in Romans 12 too, but rather we will have been transformed or converted by the renewing of our minds. This conversion may begin with a very specific prayer or event in our lives, but generally it's a long work in progress. As Paul said in today's scripture, we refer to the scriptures for guidance and to the teachings of Jesus for our example. We scour the writings of the prophets and the apostles for principles that we can live our lives by. We meditate and pray over the word of God and then pray that the spirit of God will apply these things in our lives and through our lives. But beside all that, Christianity is relational. And we need to be conjoined in community with other believers so that we can grow together. Proverbs 27.17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Can't sharpen ourselves necessarily. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul states that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This speaks of the eternal value of the Scriptures, which was the Old Testament at this time. But certainly we've expanded it for the New Testament as well. We understand that there's value in all of this. We also understand that there's eternal value in Christian accountability, Christian education, and Christian service that takes place in this fellowship. Christianity is not just an individual race, but it also might be looked at as a relay race. The outcome of our race is dependent on others to a degree, just as their race may depend on us. At our home church uh, at Court Street in Auburn, they had a women's jail ministry. Now, a couple of the ladies from the church would attend prison faithfully every Wednesday afternoon or evening so that they could hold Bible study and prayer time with some of the women who were incarcerated. There were some great breakthroughs that were made during those visits. And several women said that they wanted to change and give their lives to Christ. When they were released, however, they went back to their old home, to their old family and friends, old habits, and they found themselves distanced from Christ. They often returned to jail and found the same love and patience from our church ladies in the jail ministry. Christians need to surround themselves with other Christians, be part of a Christian fellowship for support and accountability. Even those that were born again forever ago need Christian fellowship and accountability. Now finally, we should be confident. As Paul said, not confident in the things that we have accomplished or achieved and through the law, but we need to be confident through Christ. We are intentionally created. We are divinely called. We are mercifully converted. And we have Christian community. Unlike the world around us that looks to anchor their identity and their sense of belonging and things like that move, shifting cultural sands or shaky piers, we drop our anchor on the immovable rock that is Jesus Christ. We have a new life and a new identity, a chance for that do-over that we always wanted as kids. This is the only place you're going to get a do-over is through Jesus Christ. We are children of God, mercifully redeemed. We have been chosen by the King, so we should live confidently and identify ourselves as His. To identify as anything else would just be foolish. To deny our identity in Christ before men would be tragic. Don't ever forget that Jesus said, Everyone who acknowledges me before men, 
I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Identify with Christ and be sure he can identify with you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will forgive our weakness and our fear and our self-reliance. Please forgive us for constantly deciding to rebel against you and against your will and your word. We haven't done anything to be worthy, but you cared enough to send your son to take the punishment for all our disobedience. And he willfully and lovingly accepted his role, suffering terribly so that we could be restored to you and your family. Even now, there's so much that we're afraid of. And we ask you to give us confidence and peace in your love and promises. And we ask that you constantly draw us closer to you. Please give us the opportunity daily to share our love for you with others and strengthen us so that we will never deny you when the pressure's on. Thank you for your patience and love. We humbly and gratefully pray in Jesus' name. Amen.